I'm Mary. While I was working in my upstairs room, I suddenly heard a noise from the living room downstairs. Could it be a burglar? Ready to call for help at any moment, I gripped my cell phone and went to check the living room. There, I found my sister-in-law, Jennifer. J Jennifer? Oh, Mary, you're here. Jennifer turned around. At the sound of my voice, you scared me, sneaking in like that. Huh? This is William's family home, so it's practically my home, too. William is the name of my brother. Setting that aside, I kind of understood what Jennifer was trying to say. But still, isn't it rude to enter someone's house without permission? I couldn't help feeling irked, but Jennifer seemed displeased with my reaction. Approaching me, she said, Instead of that, you're home again today. Well, <sighs> having someone like you as a sister-in-law is really the worst. Excuse me? What do you mean by that? Are you still clueless? I'm saying it's embarrassing to be single and unemployed. Jennifer spoke to me in a mocking tone. I couldn't deny being single. But the unemployment part was a misunderstanding on her part. I do work, even if it's from home. So I quickly retorted, I am working. But Jennifer didn't believe me. Instead, she mocked me further. Yeah, yeah, a home security guard, right? That's not it. I'm... Whatever, it's embarrassing and a nuisance, so just leave. I had no choice but to stay silent. I remembered that Jennifer had always been this way since our first meeting. It was years ago when Jennifer first came into our lives. William had brought her home, introducing her as the person he wanted to marry. I didn't intend to meet Jennifer then, not because I opposed the marriage, but simply because I was a recluse. This began in high school due to my inability to gauge social distances. Making friends was difficult. This led to me becoming increasingly withdrawn from school and eventually becoming a recluse. But neither my parents nor William blamed me. It's okay if you don't want to go to school. My dad, Robert, would say, Maybe you'll find what you want to do if you take your time. William encouraged me, and my mom, Ashley, silently supported me. Thanks to them, I could deeply consider my future. I can't go outside, but maybe there's something I can do for my room. With that, I decided to see what I could do with a computer. In this era, as long as you have an internet connection, anything is possible. There are ways to work other than going to an office. I'll start with what I can do alone. After that, I began to explore various possibilities. But with little knowledge or skill, there wasn't much I could do. I feel like I can't do anything. It was during such a low moment that William came to me with an idea. Mary, you play games, right? Games? A little, I guess. How about trying to be a game tester? William brought me a job opportunity as a game tester. The task was to check whether pre-release games worked properly. It didn't require any special skills. All it needed was motivation and perseverance. I'd like to try that, I answered immediately. And so I began working as a tester. This job suited me perfectly. I could work diligently on my own. Reporting was as simple as sending emails. Even for someone like me who struggled with social interaction, this was manageable. I immersed myself in the tester job. As I worked, I realized something. If I knew more about programming, Maybe I could even suggest fixes. That's how I started to get interested in programming. But programming requires a lot of learning. Usually people study at IT vocational schools. However, it's not necessary to attend such schools. There are online courses, and you can also study independently. It's about having the will, isn't it? I use the internet to its fullest to start learning programming. I explored various sites, accumulating the necessary knowledge. Whenever I didn't understand something, I'd ask someone online. And someone I didn't even know would kindly respond. Someone is responding to my voice. That made me happy. Gradually, I found friends who were also studying programming. We interacted online, and I started sharing personal things. Initially, our interaction was just through text but it eventually led to voice calls and finally meeting in person. I was nervous, of course. 
memories of my bitter high school days resurfaced. But I was no longer the high school me. Dressed up a bit, I went to the meeting place, where several men and women of my age were present. I timidly approached them, but we hit it off quickly. It was no different from our online interactions. The only difference was whether they were behind the screen or in front of me. Feeling reassured, I got lost in conversation. Then someone suggested, Let's start a business. I was anxious, but I thought I could work if it was with these people. I agreed immediately. That's how I started a company with friends I met online. Some had experiences in sales. Others had worked in regular companies. With such a diverse group, we faced no major issues in starting our business. Mary, just do what you can, they told me, and I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I committed to giving my best in what I could do, and then, a month later, I received my first paycheck. It was totally different from the earnings I got as a tester. It was my first salary as a full-time employee. For someone who had given up in high school, this was a huge deal. Now, I'm like everyone else. Until now, I had lived in a world isolated from society. But this made me feel like part of the community. Afterwards, I thanked my parents and William with my first salary, a token of gratitude for not giving up on me when I became a recluse. My parents were happy, and so was William. Their smiles motivated me to work even harder. The company grew rapidly, and my salary increased significantly. However, I didn't have much to spend it on. Most of my work was done from home, so I didn't need things like suits for commuting. The only place I'd occasionally go was the nearby grocery store. Since my work was almost like a hobby, I had virtually no use for money. Mom, what should I do? Should I just save it? Well, saving is good, but sometimes it's okay to spend boldly. After much thought, I decided to buy something significant. A house. My workplace is my room. It needs to be a place where I can relax and concentrate on work. In an apartment, you have to be mindful of neighbors. So a detached house seemed like a better option. I'll buy a house with land. It was quite a bold idea, even for me. But at that time, I didn't think too deeply about it. So I bought a detached house with land. Robert and William were surprised, but they're not the kind of people to oppose what I do. They accepted it graciously. Only Mom seemed worried. I shouldn't have said anything. Mom regretted her words. It's okay. I wanted to buy it. Really? If that's the case, then it's fine. Mom's regret might not be completely gone. But that changed instantly when we moved in. This kitchen is so user-friendly. Ashley was overjoyed with the state of the art kitchen. That moment, I felt glad I bought the house. Robert also expressed his satisfaction. It's close to the company, and having a parking space is convenient. William spoke to me earnestly. I'm proud to see Mary, all grown up. It's because you introduced me to the tester job. But without your efforts, this wouldn't have happened. You're amazing, Mary. Thank you. I owe so much to William. That's why when I heard about William's fiancé coming, I decided not to meet her. I thought it'd be better to pretend I didn't exist, so William wouldn't be judged because of me. But William thought differently. Mary is my proud sister. I want you to greet the woman who's going to be your sister-in-law. Okay, I understand. With William's words, I couldn't refuse. So I decided to meet Jennifer. Nice to meet you. I'm Jennifer. My first impression of Jennifer was that she liked brands. Apparently, she worked at a bank, and her clothes and accessories were all branded. Even her perfume was from a top brand. However, she spoke elegantly and seemed considerate. My parents quickly took a liking to her. Thus, the family meeting went smoothly. Well, I have work to do, I said, trying to leave early. I thought it would be fine for the rest to enjoy a meal together, my parents, William and Jennifer. That's what I thought. My parents and William didn't try to stop me, but Jennifer was different. As I was about to leave, Jennifer stopped me. Hey, why don't we exchange contact information? 
We're going to be sisters-in-law, after all. Uh, but... Come on, let's get going, Jennifer said cheerfully. For some reason, her smile sent chills down my spine. I had a bad feeling about her, but I couldn't refuse in that atmosphere. Okay, I'll go get my cell phone. I just wanted to get it over with quickly. I could always brush her off if she contacted me. Thinking this, I went to get my cell phone. Jennifer then smirked unpleasantly. Since we're here, let's go together. Show me your room, will you? Uh, okay. I took Jennifer to my room. Looking into my room, Jennifer said, So, this is your room. You're a recluse here, aren't you? A recluse? Yes, just staying in your room, unemployed, isn't that right? I instinctively braced myself against such a spiteful person. Then laughing, Jennifer said, <laughs> What, you're on guard against me? Did you hate being called unemployed that much? Of course, I'm not unemployed. Home-based work isn't a real job. You can't make a living that way. I can. Yeah, as long as someone supports you. Supporting me? Thinking you're a full-fledged adult with just a small income? Don't make me laugh. How much I earn is none of your business. It matters to me. Having an unmarried, unemployed sister-in-law is embarrassing. I am single, but I'm not unemployed. Oh, right. You do home-based work. Sorry. I'm forgetful. She was completely looking down on me. Jennifer didn't seem to consider remote work as a real job. It was clear she just wanted to tease me and be alone with me. That's all I understand. I glared at Jennifer, visibly annoyed. Looking at me like that won't change the reality. If you're upset, find a real job. I am working. You're such an annoying child. If you weren't here, I could have lived in this house. Jennifer's spiteful words were unbearable. She could visit, but she couldn't force me out, because this is my house. Yet, unaware of this, Jennifer frequently came over and whispered to me to leave when my parents and William weren't around. It was intolerable. Can't she just stop? I grumbled to myself. And today, it finally happened. Jennifer silently entered the house and outright told me to leave. That was the last straw for me. I won't leave, and don't enter the house without permission. What? An unemployed person telling me off? I'm not calling you a nuisance. I'm saying what you're doing is unreasonable. Shut up! Be quiet for once! Jennifer headed upstairs. I hurried after her and found her in my room. What are you doing? This is my room. I yelled, but Jennifer ignored me. Looking around my room, she said, this is perfect. There's a computer and it's spacious. Better suited for me than you. Get out of my room. Shut up, unemployed. You don't deserve it, so I'll take it. What? No way. Get out. Somehow I managed to push Jennifer out of my room. Then I forcibly dragged her out of the house. I was surprised by my own strength. Thinking it was like playing with fire, I quickly called William. Despite being at work, William answered. What's up, Mary? Did something happen? William, actually, I explained how Jennifer had entered the house on her own and also told him about how she had been demeaning me all this time. William was furious. What? To my dear sister? I can't forgive this. Okay, I'll talk to her. Thanks, William. After thanking him, I hung up. But I can't always rely on William. Pondering, I decided to call my colleague James. James was a bit older than me, a college graduate. He used to work at a general company. He joined our startup wanting to do IT work. With his extensive experience, I made it a point to consult James when in trouble. James, it's not about work. I have a personal issue. What's wrong? Well, I discussed Jennifer's actions with James. Angry, as if it were his own issue, James said. That's wrong of Jennifer. You're not at fault, Mary. Right, yeah. So, have you figured out any countermeasures? That's just it. I haven't at all. Then I'll tell you a good strategy. It's this. James shared a certain plan with me. Indeed, an interesting strategy. 
If successful, it would surely teach Jennifer a lesson. But there was one problem. Won't this trouble you, James? Don't worry about me. Just go ahead and try it. Thank you. I decided to execute James's plan. Immediately, I contacted a certain place. Months passed while I implemented the countermeasures. Jennifer's attacks on me ceased, probably due to William's scolding. I hope it stays this way. I was slightly relieved. However, the world isn't always so kind. A few days later, Jennifer called me. Can I come over tomorrow? It's okay if I call before coming, right? Her tone was deliberately unpleasant. Still, if Jennifer came, there was a high chance of executing James's plan. Reluctantly, I pretended to agree. The next day, Jennifer arrived at the house and immediately asked, Are your parents here? They're not. They're on a trip. Oh, that's perfect. While saying so, Jennifer brought a large bag into the house. What is that? My clothes and various things. Are you planning to stay here? Not just staying. I'm moving in. So you should leave. You're an eyesore. It finally happened. With that in mind, I quietly nodded. Understood. You're complaining. Wait, you understand? Yes, I'll leave. You suddenly became obedient? I've thought about it. You are William's wife. I owe a lot to William. I said this with a solemn demeanor. Jennifer then started to smile unpleasantly. Finally, you understand. Now get out. Useless, unemployed. Okay. I immediately went upstairs. Actually, per James's instructions, my belongings were already packed, and I had a place to move to. In other words, everything was going according to James's plan. I called the moving company and went to the living room, where Jennifer was relaxing on the sofa. You're fast. Well, a reclusive unemployed wouldn't have much to move, I guess. Although I wanted to retort, I didn't. I'm leaving now. The movers will come later for my things. Yeah, yeah. And please, don't regret this. Regret? As if. I feel refreshed without a recluse around. Leaving Jennifer's mocking laughter behind, I left the house. Then I contacted my parents. Dad, are you enjoying the trip? Yeah, I'm really happy with this present. I'm glad, actually. I told them about Jennifer's visit to the house. I explained the reason for the sudden trip and James's strategy, and I asked them to act accordingly. My parents agreed readily, largely due to the description of Jennifer's unreasonable behavior. This will work out well. She'll regret it. Muttering to myself, I headed to my new home. A few days after moving... The end of the month was approaching, and I was excited. Any time now, Jennifer should contact me. I waited for the call. Then it came. The phone rang, and as soon as I answered, Jennifer yelled, What's the meaning of this? What's wrong, Jennifer? Why do I have to leave? You don't have to leave. Just pay the rent. Rent? This house is our family home, isn't it? It was. But I've sold it. You sold it? Why do you get to decide that? Because it was my house. Your house? Yes, that house was. I explained about starting an IT company with my colleagues and working there. William must have told her, too. But since Jennifer looked down on me, I assumed she hadn't listened. So I explained it all from the beginning. Shocked, Jennifer asked, So you really sold this house? Yes, are you familiar with leaseback? What's that? Leaseback is a system where you sell your home to a company and then rent it to continue living there. It has benefits like paying off loans with the sale proceeds. I used that leaseback. I sold the house and land I bought, then stopped paying rent after the contract ended when Jennifer arrived. That meant Jennifer couldn't continue living there unless she signed a new contract herself. But Jennifer, who relied on William, wouldn't be able to pay the rent herself, and I doubted she would want to live there with William after driving me out. In short, Jennifer would have nowhere to live. Remember this after playing your games. I couldn't help but laugh at her empty threat. <laughs>
It was entirely her fault. If she hadn't looked down on me, she could have had a happy married life. Such a pointless person. She'll probably end up divorced from William, and I won't have to see her again. That's what I thought. But it was that evening when James called me. Mary, something terrible has happened. Can you contact your brother right away? He should be finishing work soon, so I can. Then tell him, and also... James spoke rapidly about various things. Essentially, he wanted me and William to come to his house. Curious, I contacted William and then headed to James's place first. When I arrived, there was a commotion outside James's apartment. Many police officers were there, and neighbors had gathered to see what was happening. J James, what happened? I approached James, who was in the middle of the commotion. Actually, some weird woman tried to take my laptop. Here's what James told me. While he was taking a shower during a break at work, he heard a strange noise and peeked into his room. There, a woman was rummaging through his belongings, apparently trying to take his laptop. Of course, James immediately confronted her. As soon as he shouted, the woman got startled and ran away. But she tried to escape through a window, fell, and lost consciousness. That woman was Jennifer and she was arrested by the police for breaking and entering. However, Jennifer insisted, This is my sister's room, and wouldn't back down, causing the commotion. This isn't your room, right? The police asked. Of course it wasn't my room, but I wondered why Jennifer thought it was my room. When I asked her, Jennifer said to me, It's your room. I sent your belongings here. My belongings? Yes, I heard it from the movers. When Jennifer was at the house, I had called the movers and left her there. But as per James' instructions, my belongings were first sent to his room, then forwarded to my new home. Unaware of this, Jennifer assumed the delivery address was where I moved to. But that doesn't justify breaking and entering, does it? It's your fault, you! Jennifer's excuse was this. When I left the house, I had all furniture and appliances taken by the movers. However, Jennifer apparently thought something would be left behind. Her plan was to sell the leftovers and use the money for living expenses, but that plan failed. She thought she could still manage if the house was there, but then she learned she couldn't live there anymore. In retaliation, she planned to sell my laptop for cash. She intended to enter my house, but ended up in James's room instead. That was the real story. It's your fault. Remember this. The police took her away. Jennifer continued to shout such things. In the end, Jennifer and William got divorced. William demanded compensation from Jennifer. However, there was no way Jennifer could pay it, because she had debts. She wanted to take over our house to sell its contents for money to pay off her debts. Anyway, Jennifer is in prison now, unable to do anything and her parents ended up paying the compensation on her behalf. Because of Jennifer's incident, I've come to rely on James more than ever. I might not have been able to do anything without him. That's when I realized something. Ah, I am in love with James. Now that I've realized this, I've started to make strong advances towards James. Never received an allowance? What do you mean? What? This bombshell dropped during a conversation with my father-in-law one day. I couldn't believe something like this was happening behind my back. My name is Emma, and I'm 29. I've been living with my husband John since we got married four years ago. So this happened on a particular day. When I came home from work, my usually late arriving husband was already home. I sensed something was off just by looking at him. Cans of beer and highball drinks were scattered all over the floor, and his face was flushed red. Whoa, John, what's going on? As I rushed over, he snapped. Enough! I can't take it anymore! What do you mean you can't take it? And since when do you drink this much? That's my business. Darn it, my lousy boss. 
lousy boss. John complains about his company, constantly badmouthing his boss and his colleagues. Something must have gone wrong at work today. I decided to try and calm him down. It's been a tough day, huh? I'm making your favorite stew for dinner tonight. Let's eat together. Despite my upbeat attitude, his facial expression remained unchanged. In fact, he seemed even more irritated. My husband kept drinking, so I decided to speak up. Hey, John, are you okay? You have work tomorrow. Maybe you should get some sleep. He then let out a big sigh. <sighs> I'm done, Emma. I'm not going to work tomorrow. What? Not going to work? What's going on? Did he get into a fight with his boss? I decided to probe further. What do you mean you're not going tomorrow? Did something happen at work? No, I simply got fired. Fired? A word I never expected to hear. Even I was taken aback. Wait, wait a minute. Fired? Why so suddenly? That's too abrupt. Don't ask me. They just told me out of the blue. I don't know if it's poor management or cost cutting, but honestly, I'm done with that place. I feel relieved now. Done with it, you say? To be honest, I was anything but relieved. We could afford our current home because both of us were working. Expenses for groceries, bills, and even money sent to my father-in-law and mother-in-law. Anyway, I've been fired. Just let me do as I please for today. My husband was seriously drunk and out of control. If he doesn't find a new job, we won't be able to continue sending money to his parents. With that thought, I decided to contact my father-in-law when the time was right. The next morning, as expected, I found my husband asleep on the sofa. Empty cans were strewn everywhere, indicating he had been drinking late into the night. After cleaning up the cans, I called my father-in-law. Hello, is this father-in-law? Sorry for calling so early. Oh, Emma, what's going on? Well, it's hard to say, but John was suddenly fired. What? John got fired? Is this for real? Yes. He mentioned something about poor management and cutting personnel costs. That's sudden. As I explained the situation to father-in-law, I felt terrible. After all, it was thanks to him and mother-in-law that my husband had his job. Ever since we got married, he was addicted to slot machines. In the beginning, I had no idea about his gambling habit and cheerfully saw him off to work each morning. Take care. Have a good day. Yeah, I'll be late because of overtime today. Don't push yourself too hard. I had always assumed that he was genuinely working hard, but when I noticed a tobacco smell coming from my husband, who never smokes, I instantly felt something was off. I confronted him right away. He defended himself by saying he started smoking due to stress. No way. You used to hate smoking so much. My husband's behavior keeps getting stranger by the day. The kind and gentle man he once was is gone, and he's getting increasingly irritable. One day, he stopped hiding the fact that he was going to the casino. Even worse, he started pouring his entire salary and savings into gambling. He doesn't even care about skipping work anymore. All that matters to him is whether he wins or loses that day. Hey, are you really not going to work anymore? Shut up. It's none of your business. I'm using my own money, so stay out of it. With that, he rudely dismisses me and hurries out of the house. 
Then, as always, he comes home after losing all his money. When he hit rock bottom, he even asked me for money. I'll double it and pay you back. Just lend me 300 bucks. I'm telling you, tomorrow's going to be good. You can't lend me a few hundred dollars when your husband is in trouble? His character keeps changing due to gambling. The gentle husband I once knew is long gone. Eventually, he started borrowing money just to gamble. I finally lost it at this point. Wait, what are you doing? Borrowing money to play slots is absurd, don't you think? He doesn't show any sign of remorse, no matter how much I press him. In fact, he gets defensive and says it's my fault he had to borrow money. What? I had to take out a loan because you wouldn't lend me money. This guy's totally addicted to gambling. If I don't stop him now, we'll go bankrupt. Are you kidding me? I didn't lend you the money because I wanted you to quit playing slots. I'm covering all our living expenses since our savings are gone. And you still blame me? Just lend me the money. I'll win at the slots and prove it. Just listen to me. Have you ever hit a big win? I don't think so. Stop chasing illusions and face reality. Stop interfering with my entertainment. I wish he would at least stay within the bounds of reason. But my husband was fully addicted to gambling. This reckless behavior was tearing our marriage apart. No matter how much I tried to get through to him, he wouldn't listen. I was starting to lose hope. Days became long as I was consumed by my worry. It was my father-in-law and mother-in-law who finally stepped in and set him straight. Do you even realize you have a family? You're racking up debt over slot machines. Apologize to Emma now. Yeah, you have an amazing wife and you're ruining it. If you keep this up, she'll divorce you. Father-in-law and mother-in-law scolded him time and again, stressing the importance of marriage and family. Finally, he broke down and apologized. Emma, I'm really sorry. I swear, no more slot machines. Please forgive me. Afterwards, my father-in-law said this to me. Emma, what our son did is inexcusable. We've also put you through so much. If you can, please find it in you to forgive him just this once. Seeing the desperation in my in-law's apology, I decided to give my husband another chance. From there, it was father-in-law and mother-in-law who took on his debt and even helped him find a new job. Until he got his finances stable, they even sent us living expenses. It was thanks to father-in-law and mother-in-law that we could continue living as we had been. I was grateful from the bottom of my heart and sent them $500 every month to repay the favor. But now, if my husband loses his job, we won't be able to send them anything. I apologized to father-in-law over the phone. Father-in-law, I'm really sorry. I can't believe this is happening while I'm still here. Don't worry about it. It's the company's decision, right? You're not at fault. Father-in-law's kind words touched me deeply. However, I still have to break more difficult news. So, I'm really sorry, but I don't think we can continue sending money to you and mother-in-law anymore. Then father-in-law said in a puzzled tone, A remittance? Never received anything like that, you know. My mind went blank at father-in-law's response. You mean you didn't get the money I've been sending every month? The $500? We've been doing it consistently, haven't we? What are you talking about? I even checked with my wife just now. She doesn't know anything about it either. What? 
That couldn't be right. I had been scrimping and saving last month, put $500 in an envelope, and given it to my husband. The idea that it never reached father-in-law and mother-in-law? Emma, what's going on here? I don't know myself, but it's true that I've been giving my husband money every month to pass on to you. Father-in-law spoke up again after hearing my desperate plea. Emma, can I come over tonight? And let's keep this between us for now, okay? All right. I had definitely been giving my husband the $500. If it hadn't reached father-in-law and mother-in-law, there's only one explanation. My husband. I can't believe this. He must have been using the money for himself. Unforgivable! I'll make him confess everything and he will face the consequences. An hour later, father-in-law and mother-in-law showed up at our house. When they walked into the living room, my husband looked surprised. Dad, Mom, what are you doing here? He was clearly rattled. It was obvious he was hiding something. John, is there something you'd like to tell us? Father-in-law indirectly confronted him, but my husband pretended not to know. What are you talking about? Emma must be as confused as I am, so could you just leave? I couldn't take it anymore and yelled at my husband. Stop using me! Just tell the truth now! My husband looked at me with wide eyes. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. What happened to the money I've been giving you to pass on to your father and mother? It was obvious that my husband was flustered by my questioning. I, um, about that. Your parents said they'd never received any money. But I've been giving it to you every month for the past two years. Where did it all go? No, it's not what you think, Emma. There's a reason for this. A reason? Do tell. Where did that money vanish to? Explain it in a way we'll understand. Go on. My husband's face turned increasingly pale. His earlier bravado gone. What? Can't say? Don't tell me you've been using it yourself. Both his parents and I glared at him. Finally, realizing he couldn't lie his way out, my husband opened his mouth. I... I'm sorry. I actually... I've been using it on slot machines. What? Slot machines? You've got to be joking! It was the last thing I wanted to hear. Even after everything that happened in the past, he was gambling again. I can't believe this. You promised you'd never touch slots again. We decided to send money to your parents as a way to make amends for all the trouble you've caused them. What are you thinking? As I yelled at him, tears spilled down my cheeks. Was I the only one who thought we'd finally be able to give back to his parents? My vision blurred from the tears. His mother patted my back gently. Just to confirm, is it true that you got laid off due to company reasons? Um, at his father's question, my husband visibly flinched. Yes, it's true. John, if there's a time to correct the record, it's now. If we find out you're lying... Before his father could finish, my husband hurriedly apologized to us. I'm sorry. The truth is, I was fired due to my poor work performance. It wasn't due to company downsizing or cost-cutting. I was speechless at my husband's words completely dumbfounded. His dad, father-in-law, quickly pressed on. What do you mean by work attitude? What the heck have you been doing? Actually, they found out I've been skipping work to go to the 
casino. Oh, this is hopeless. The moment I heard that, everything felt utterly ridiculous. I had forgiven his past and decided to start fresh, to support each other. What was all my effort for? Are you kidding me? His dad exploded in anger. How many times do we have to say it? Grow up and act responsibly, especially when you have a family. And yet you pull this stupid stunt again. As his mom, my mother-in-law, quietly wept beside me, I couldn't even shed a tear. All I could do was look at my pathetic husband who just kept apologizing. Facing the enraged father-in-law, my husband kept on making excuses without end. But I'll do better at my next job, okay? It was just bad luck this time. That's it. Let's get a divorce. The words slipped out unconsciously. What, Emma, divorce? You're, you're joking, right? To my distraught husband, I unleash my pent-up anger. A joke? You think I'm joking in this situation? But isn't divorce a bit extreme for this? Extreme? Are you kidding me? Do you even understand what you've done? It's no different than embezzlement. My voice quivered with anger. It's too late. What? You've betrayed us twice. I have no confidence in spending my life with someone like that. We're getting a divorce. I can't believe this. His dad, who had been watching, nodded in agreement. We don't consider you our son anymore. From now on, we cut our parental ties. Wh wait a minute. Emma, Mom, Dad, you're joking, right? Uh, forgive me, please. My husband was pleading through his tears, but our minds were made up. There was no turning back. I had him fill out the divorce papers right there in front of his parents. Thank you for everything. Goodbye. With my packed bags and the divorce papers in hand, I left the apartment. Emma, wait. Let's talk this over one more time. I won't do it again, I promise. Wait for me, Emma. He screamed after me the entire time, but I never looked back. It seems his parents had the same resolve. They moved far away right after this incident, making sure he couldn't rely on them anymore. I haven't kept tabs on him since. Rumor has it the debts from his gambling have piled up, and he's in a tight spot. Now he's apparently scraping by, running away from creditors. Hearing about his predicament doesn't stir any feelings in me. It's all his own doing. On the other hand, I've been living a fulfilling life. I still maintain a good relationship with his parents. We even meet up for meals during my days off. Marrying him was a mistake. But meeting such wonderful in-laws has become a treasure for me. Going forward... I want to give back to them as much as I can. I lost my mother to illness when I was in elementary school. My father was the one who worked hard to raise me. I loved my gentle father dearly. When I married my husband Ethan, my father shed tears and said, Please, take good care of Lily. My only concern was Ethan's parents. Both my father-in-law and mother-in-law graduated from prestigious private universities. They were true elites. Father-in-law established his own company when he was young and literally made a fortune in one generation. However, not long after we married, the company went bankrupt. It was because mother-in-law, who was registered as an executive, spent too much of the company's money. My desperate in-laws suggested moving in together. Clearly, we're going to have children, and we can't afford to support you, Ethan argued. Listening to my husband's words, I sighed with relief. Unless there was a need for caregiving, I wanted to avoid living with my in-laws. 
It seemed my husband felt the same. Then father-in-law yelled, Are you repaying the kindness of raising you with ingratitude? Mother-in-law began to cry. This is what happens when you marry a woman from a poor family. You've become rotten to the core. My in-laws wanted to live together. We wanted to avoid it. The conversation got nowhere. It's really impossible to live together, but maybe we can send some money. My husband said that, and I glared at him. But paying money meant we wouldn't have to live together. I chose the option that would lighten my mental burden, persuaded by my husband. However, this was the beginning of our troubles. The agreement was to provide $300 a month, but they kept asking for additional money every month, saying, We can't pay for medical bills and medicine. Or, My back hurts, so I need to go to a chiropractor. I had my doubts about whether this was true, but I didn't feel like going to check. If we refused, they might bring up living together again. I grappled with frustration, but endured the constant begging for money. Our finances were barely making ends meet every month. That's why I started working part-time at a bar, leaving my young son Noah at the childcare center. The bar paid well, and they would let me take home leftover food. Somehow, we managed to stabilize our finances. And when Noah turned 10, my husband was ordered to transfer by his company. Since the transfer was to a rural area, Noah and I considered moving with him. But my husband said, It's better to be near your father. And thought of my father, who lived alone. My father's house was about 20 minutes away by train. The transfer location was at a distance that required the use of a bullet train. I decided to rely on my husband's words. While I was working at the bar, my father would take care of Noah. He seemed happy to spend time with his grandson. I would take home food from the bar and my father, Noah and I, would gather around the dining table. Noah, who never warmed up to his paternal grandparents, was unreservedly affectionate with my father. My humble and grandson-loving father, on the other hand, was the complete opposite of my in-laws. They would brazenly claim to be my parents and eat and drink as they pleased at the bar where I worked, leaving without paying. I paid all their bills. They didn't come often, but they seemed to show off to friends or juniors when they did. Once or twice a month, it still hurt to pay for them from my part-time earnings. The manager often sent something and gave me substantial discounts, saying, You're always working hard. I want to splash beer on them someday. How satisfying that would feel. I indulged in fantasies of defeating my in-laws. In the fall of Noah's junior year in high school, preparing for university entrance exams, I received a call from my husband. I can come home in the spring. Really? Yeah, and with a promotion to boot. I really put you through a lot. Let's live happily together again, the three of us. Next spring is looking busy. As soon as I hung up, the electronic sound of an incoming call rang out. Thinking it was my husband, I answered without looking. What? I inadvertently let out a careless, deflated voice. Hello, this is the city hospital? The caller explained the urgent matter in a tense voice. My father had collapsed and was taken to the hospital. He had stopped to buy Noah's favorite pudding at a convenience store and fainted in front of the cashier. I grabbed only my wallet and phone and rushed to the hospital. Although I couldn't get many details, I was told my father was in emergency surgery. Dad! I called out to him, praying, please make it, please. When I arrived at the hospital, I gave the reception staff my father's name. I heard he's in surgery now. I pressed the staff at the front desk, drenched in sweat. Please head to the fourth floor. I was directed to the operating room. The surgery wasn't over yet, so I sat on the bench, praying and waiting. Several hours later, the doctor informed me the surgery was done. The diagnosis was a stroke. There would be a slight impairment in speech and motor functions, but I was nothing but grateful that his life was spared. Dad's condition gradually stabilized. During my free time, I visited the hospital, talking to Dad, even giving his immobile hand a massage. Dad, 
Today, Noah. I made sure to tell dad all about Noah. His initial response was weak, but daily rehab was fruitful, and dad started to show signs of recovery. One day, while massaging his hand as usual, dad weakly grasped my hand. It was the first response since the surgery, and I was so happy that I cried. Dad, you did great. Then, Dad slowly shook his head and pointed at me with the hand he could move. Thank you, he stuttered, smiling. He should have had difficulty moving his facial muscles, yet he smiled at me. Stroke aside, Dad seemed to have aged, becoming smaller. I recalled him at the wedding. Take good care of Lily, he had said, firmly shaking hands with my husband. Strong, dependable hands. Now, they had become small, so it was my turn to protect Dad. I firmly grasped my thin father's hand, encouraging myself. I had to leave the hospital before evening as I had a part-time job at the bar. I hope Dad continues to recover. I started my job full of hope. My in-laws were the first to enter when the shop opened. Lily dear, they called cheerfully. They brought along two men, a bit older than themselves. I didn't care how they were related and didn't care to know. So I led them to their seats, following the restaurant's protocol. As soon as you sit, order as much as you like, said father-in-law. Don't worry about the bill, added mother-in-law, as if they won't just push it onto me again. I focused on serving them, hiding my annoyance. I just had good news about dad, after all. The peaceful events at the hospital were ruined by the in-laws in front of me. Sure enough, they knew no bounds. They ordered beer, soju, sake, one after another. The table was a mess, with spilled drinks and food scraps. The two men they brought seemed drunk and started harassing me. Hey, wife, bring the beer, quickly. What a shame, our daughter-in-law here. Really, such an incapable wife. The in-laws began to loudly criticize me on purpose. I tried to hold back since I was at work, but my heart couldn't contain it. Excuse me, customers! There are others here. Can you please quiet down a bit? I attempt a desperate counterattack. I hoped that by speaking loud enough for other customers to hear, it would embarrass my in-laws. It's just a party. Who cares? That's what they mean by, you can tell where someone's from. Look, your plate's open, ma'am. Fueled by alcohol, their remarks escalated. It seems she was raised so carelessly because she has no mother. I was so entangled by my mother-in-law's words that I couldn't respond. I was already holding back at the edge of my limits from having my daughter Noah insulted. But now, they're even mentioning my late mother. I've always wanted to splash beer on them. Imagining defeating my in-laws like this had become part of my daily routine. That day, I was virtually pouring a bottle of flat beer over their heads. In my imagination, of course. And in January, Noah was accepted into his first choice private university. On the day of the acceptance announcement, my husband also called and brought the happy news that he could come home the day before Noah's graduation ceremony. We would both be attending Noah's graduation. The night of the graduation, we had planned to celebrate Noah's success and my husband's promotion at the bar where I worked. But that meant we couldn't avoid inviting my in-laws. My father was still in the hospital, so he couldn't come but ignoring my in-laws would cause problems later. I prayed that they would be busy, but if they knew we were treating them, they would definitely come. They were two such despicable people. When I called to invite them, sure enough, both agreed to come. Noah's new private university is known nationwide as a prestigious institution, and my father-in-law pompously said, he inherited my genes. Well, see you on that day. I quickly ended the call. The night of Noah's graduation, I happily walked to the restaurant with my husband and Noah, the three of us together, after a long time. The in-laws had already arrived by taxi, I was informed. 
The restaurant manager had kindly prepared a private room for our celebration. Just thinking about my in-laws made my stomach ache. Still, I decided to smile as much as possible in front of the family and entered the restaurant. We took our seats and toasted with bottled beer for the adult, juice for Noah. Noah, congratulations! My husband smiled warmly at him. Congratulations on your promotion, I said to my husband, raising my glass. I'm really looking forward to college in the spring, Noah exclaimed. Here, this is from Grandpa. I handed Noah a cherry-colored envelope. Grandpa here refers to my father, of course. From Grandpa? Noah joyfully accepted the envelope. It's not much, but he said to enjoy college life. Grandpa prepared this celebration gift with a nurse's help. Even though his hands still aren't moving properly, I explained. Just knowing my father's feelings was enough. I had reported to my in-laws over the phone that my father had a stroke and was hospitalized. They were out playing and only responded, Oh, really? Watching them, it suddenly hit me. Speaking of which, it's really tough, huh? A stroke, he said nonchalantly. I was used to it by now, so I brushed it off. Yes, it is. But the progress is good. My father-in-law didn't seem to like my indifferent attitude and mocked my collapsed father. It's a brain disease, right? His head's gone crazy, hasn't it? Noah's brow furrowed as he looked at father-in-law. Quick to counter, my husband spoke up. Is that any way to talk? But it's the truth, isn't it? Yes, it's a brain disease, right? The in-laws were not at all shaken by their son's argument. The boastful in-laws couldn't help but enjoy the misfortune of others. Just stop it, my husband began to say, but I held up my hand to his face. Then, I splashed the lukewarm beer that was left in the glass right onto father-in-law. The flat beer left in the bottle was poured over my mother-in-law. I could endure them speaking ill of me. If it doesn't reach Noah's ears, I can bear it. But I couldn't stand to hear them say that my father, who had raised me with all his might, was crazy. My father's hand had become so small. It was up to me to protect that hand. I glared at my in-laws. Don't mock my father. The in-laws were at a loss for words, having beer suddenly thrown on them. It was just a joke! Come on! Father-in-law retorted in a low voice. My husband then countered. Dad? Mom? They slowly looked up at their son's voice. There's a reason why I invited you here today. My husband pulled out a single note from his wallet. He placed it where the in-laws could see, like a slap in the face. On it was a detailed list of the in-laws' extravagant spending. A bus tour with friends, luxury spa treatment, purchasing designer bags, and much more. You can find out about this stuff easily, he said. The in-laws no longer tried to make eye contact. Everything my husband had found seemed to be true. If you can afford to live so luxuriously, you don't need our support anymore. I quickly followed up. No, that, well... Cutting off father's indecisive words, I said, You don't need it, right? But just the allowance! Mother-in-law pleaded. No, we won't send any more money. We're cutting ties too. My husband stated firmly. Please go home. My disheveled and soaked in-laws looked at me with stunned expressions. Please leave. I pointed to the exit and said it once again. Under the pressure of my firm stance, my in-laws slithered out as if crawling on the floor. It seemed my husband knew everything. He knew the torment I was going through. Apparently, Noah would sometimes stop by the bar to say thanks for the meals. But, embarrassed to be seen by me, he waited until I wasn't there. At that time, the manager had been reporting to Noah how I was being treated by my in-laws. It's hard to tell a child this, but please protect your mom. He was told. Noah had discussed this with my husband. My husband had declared that when he returned, he would sever ties and stop all financial support. However, he had asserted that it would only be carried out once he was back 
since he couldn't protect Noah or me when he was away. And so, my husband stopped the payments as promised. Every day, my in-laws called, probably to demand the money. Before cutting ties completely, I unleashed everything I wanted to say to my in-laws. There's nothing to fear since I'm ending this relationship. After ending the call unilaterally, I blocked my in-laws' contact. A few days later, my in-laws seemed to have asked my part-time jobs manager to help them get in touch with me. They did this multiple times during business hours. The manager, annoyed, lost his temper. Don't ever come back to our store, he yelled, throwing an empty beer bottle and chasing them out. In the conversation between my in-laws at that time, I heard words like payments and monthly installments. So it seems they are likely taking cash advances or making installment payments, unable to lower their standard of living. Serves them right. I'm now working at the second bar opened by the manager. He made arrangements to ensure that my in-laws couldn't harm me if they came to the store. My father will be discharged from the hospital soon. And it's decided that we'll live together in this house. My husband and Noah both fully agreed. As I cleaned the room that will be dedicated to my father, I thought back to his small hands. I know there are people who's been cheated on and got hurt from discovering that their partner wasn't loyal, but I believe my case is even worse. And that's because my husband was upfront that he was going to cheat before he even had an affair. Allow me to cheat just for a night since my ex-girlfriend asked me to spend the night with her. That's what he said. When I responded with, fine, he was thrilled. Thanks. Honesty is indeed the best policy when married. Well, just as my husband said, honesty is the best policy. So I decided to live my life honestly too, just like him. Whatever happens to him, it's not my business anymore. I am Catherine. My boyfriend, whom we'll call Bob, is pretty blunt and can't lie. Plus, he can't refuse anyone when asked a favor, so he's always happy to help out others. That's also what I loved about him. I thought that if I married him, we could be a couple that trusted each other and kept no secrets, which is why I decided to get married to him. One weekend, Bob solemnly said to me, Catherine, you fell in love with my honest nature, right? Yes. That and your inability to refuse a favor, your good-natured personality. Then, Bob slowly pulled out a receipt from his wallet. I wanted to be honest with you, Catherine. I went here after work yesterday. The receipt Bob showed me was from a strip club in Manhattan. The total bill, a thousand dollars? My client insisted on going there, so I couldn't refuse. My boss left me and went home first, so I had no choice but to pay. This is a business expense, right? That's the problem. My company doesn't encourage going out with clients. Then you should have refused to go with them. Catherine, you know I can't say no if someone asks me, right? Other guys hide stuff like this from their wives, even when things like this happen. But I want to be always honest. Catherine, that's what you want too, right? Well, it's better than finding it out later. Exactly. I knew you'd say that, Catherine. Pleased with my reaction, Bob began to shop frequently and spent lavishly. Every time, he showed me a receipt and report his spending. Catherine, I saw the wallet I had been eyeing at a mall yesterday, so I went ahead and bought it. What? $500? You already have a wallet. Plus, that's of a high-end brand. I was just looking from outside the store window at first, but one of the staff noticed and lured me inside. They really pushed me to buy it, so I did. You can't spend so much, just out of impulse. But you know, I can't refuse when I get offered things. Right, Catherine? And then, the next day. Catherine, this is from yesterday's night out. Huh? Isn't that quite a lot? Actually, I ended up covering for my colleagues. What do you mean? When I invited them out, they said they were broke until their next paycheck. I couldn't just let them starve, could I? But still, we're also waiting for our paycheck, you know? We both work, and you have savings too, right? You know I can't say no when people rely on me. I can't say no when people rely on me. Bob emphasized that over and over, acting as though being honest meant he could do whatever. On another day, he came to me with a troubled expression. Catherine, is it okay? 
okay if I go out this weekend? Sure. What's up? Actually, my ex-girlfriend called me saying she's going through a tough time and wanted to talk about it. What? Are you going to meet her alone? Yeah. She said it's something personal. Your ex-girlfriend. The one you showed me on social media the other day, right? Her name was Alice? That's right. She was married too, wasn't she? Don't you think it's strange for her to want to meet with someone who's married too? What, do you not trust me? If I had something to hide, I wouldn't be telling you honestly like this, would I? But don't worry. Besides, I already agreed on seeing her. What? Without even asking me? She came to me for help. How could I say no? Do you think I could ever do that? Fine. Even when meeting his ex-girlfriend Alice, Bob would tell me about it up front. I knew about Alice from before, but I was anxious about letting Bob see her, considering the fact that he can't say no when asked for a favor. And sure enough, my worries came true. Late that night, I got a text from Bob. Catherine, sorry. I only got the chance to text you now. Gosh, I was so worried about you. So, when are you coming home? You'll make the last train, right? Well, it seems I won't be able to come home tonight. You can't come home? Why? Alice, she seems troubled about her husband. She doesn't want to go home tonight. She said she's told her husband that she's staying at her friend's place. I'm a little confused. So you mean she wanted to spend the night with you from the very beginning? Yeah, I guess so. She just wanted to see me today and share her thoughts. She said she wanted to spend the night with me, just like old times. Like old times? You mean when you two were dating? Isn't that cheating? But it's just for tonight, which is why I'm telling you up front. Huh? Whether it's just for a night or not, that's still cheating. But isn't it better than me being sneaky about it? I'm only saying it to you because I am sincere, Catherine. How dare you? She said I was the only one that could help her. When asked like that, I can't say no. You understand that, right? Please, just forgive me this one time. Bob was asking me to accept his cheating. How insensitive of him. As I was at a loss for words, I heard a female voice from the other end of the line that sounded like Alice. Hey Bob, can you end the call already? Catherine, hold on for a bit. Bob hastily said to me, then started talking to Alice. He must have been in such a hurry that he forgot to put himself on mute. I could clearly hear the conversation between Bob and Alice. Bob, can you really convince your wife? Yeah, just give me another second. She knows that I can't turn down people when I for help, and that's what she loves about me. So as long as I'm upfront about things, she'll let anything slide. She's an idiot. Really? Gosh, she's pretty dumb, huh? Right? Once I get her approval, I can do anything I want. I can meet you as much as I want, as long as I tell her beforehand. I made a wise choice of picking a dumb woman, so I can be open with my affairs. You have to thank me, you know? Bob. You're so cunning. Yeah, even with money, as long as I have some excuse, she'll let me splurge as much as I want. I'll get you some designer stuff next time. Really? Are you sure? Sure, I'll just say. A rookie begged for it and I couldn't turn him down. And she'll be fine with it. I love you, Bob. I love you too, Alice. Then go on. Convince your silly wife. Quickly. Don't worry about it. I've got this. Holding the phone, my hand started trembling uncontrollably. This was Bob's true feelings. I have been fooled by him this whole time. As I realized this, my feelings for Bob faded away in an instant. Bob got back on the phone, unaware that I had heard it all. Sorry for keeping you waiting, Catherine. Alice said she doesn't want to go home tonight. That's fine. I was just thinking about how it's important to be honest with your partner in a relationship. You can do whatever you want, honey. Thanks, Catherine. I knew you'd understand, said Bob with a happy tone before hanging up. Right after the call ended, I called someone else. After doing everything I had to do, I was finally able to go to sleep. Bob returned home in a good mood. Catherine, I'm back. Welcome back. I see you're in a good mood. Yeah, I was just appreciating how understanding you are. If I'd come home right away, I would have felt guilty towards Alice. But I hate lying to you, Catherine. That's why I think it was right to tell you the truth. It's important to always be honest about these things. Yes, indeed. Bob, will you continue to be honest with me forever? Of course. I could never lie or keep a secret from you, Catherine. I will tell you everything honestly.
no matter what happens. I hope you keep your words, baby. Just as I said that, the doorbell rang. It looks like he's here. At those words, Bob asked, who's here? Without a word, I invited the visitor into our house. A man entered our living room and immediately shouted at Bob upon seeing him. You're the one Alice is cheating on me with, aren't you? Huh? What are you talking about? Right after Bob admitted that he was cheating on me, I texted Alice's husband. Your wife is having an affair with my husband. It seemed that Alice's husband had suspected something was off, and so he believed me without a doubt. And so, he requested to speak with my husband once, and I gave him our address. Bob was flustered as he glanced at Alice's husband and me. To him, Alice's husband said, I heard from your wife that you were with Alice last night. What's going on? Catherine said that? Bob seemed to finally grasp the situation. He started making excuses to Alice's husband. No, no, you've got it all wrong. It's a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding. Yes, yes, I was indeed with Alice last night, but it was just a casual hangout, like a reunion. Nothing inappropriate happened. Without missing a beat, I chimed in. Bob, have you forgotten what you said earlier? You promised to be honest, right? You told me yesterday it's just for one night. Please forgive my affair with Alice. Didn't you? Upon hearing my words, Alice's husband became even more irate. I knew it. She was cheating on me. Bob probably realized that he couldn't get away with this, and he finally admitted to having an affair. Alice's husband was fuming, demanding for compensation as Bob repeatedly apologized. In the end, Bob had no choice but to swallow whatever conditions the man had thrown at him. Once Alice's husband had a written promise for compensation, he finally left. As soon as we were alone, Bob turned on me. Why the hell did you tell Alice's husband? Because you said we should always be honest, remember? It's not fair if I'm the only one that knows about your affair. Bob couldn't argue with that and suddenly became quiet. Just because not everyone is as understanding as you, Catherine. Anyway, what's done is done. We need to figure out how to pay off this compensation now. At this rate, we'll never be able to pay it off while maintaining our current lifestyle. He really overcharged us. Well, you had no right to refuse, did you? And it wasn't a situation where we could negotiate the amount, right? But if it's you and me, we can surely overcome this. Catherine, can you take on more work? Why should I? There's a limit to how much we can cut back on living expenses, and my company forbids having side jobs. I think the only option is for you to take on another job to pay off our compensation. That's not what I mean. I'm asking, why do I have to pay for what you did? Well, aren't we a married couple? Aren't we supposed to team up and overcome this together? Don't make me laugh. Why do I have to clean up after your mess? I am the one who got cheated on here. But you approved of me having an affair, didn't you? So you're also responsible to pay compensation. That's ridiculous. If anything, I'm the one who should be demanding alimony. You can't demand alimony while you're married to me. Yes, I can, because I have no intention of staying married to you. What? Why not? Don't you understand? Why don't you reflect on your actions? You used our money because you can't say no to people. And then you cheated on me. Do you think I'll let everything slide just because you don't hide them from me? I am tired of being with an idiot like you. I handed Bob the divorce papers I had prepared. Let's get divorced. Our marriage is over. What? But we've been doing well so far. You're the only one who thinks that. I've been keeping up with your crap and lied about my feelings all this time. From now on, I'm going to be true to my feelings and live my own life. As you said, honesty is the best policy after all. My honest feelings right now are that I want to divorce you as soon as possible. That's it. Catherine, goodbye. Wishing you the best, Mr. Honest Cheater. My bags were already packed. I said everything I wanted to say, grabbed my bags, and left the house. This house will also eventually be subject to property division. For now, I just don't want to see Bob's face anymore. With all this evidence of his affair, I'm sure I'll be able to claim alimony without any problem. It might be nice to stay at a nice place somewhere for a few days while leisurely looking for a new home. Maybe Bob was at a loss for words because he didn't say anything that day. The next day, as soon as I got to work, I got a call from Bob. Catherine, did you talk about me at your office too? After Bob declared that he was going to have an affair, it wasn't just Alice's husband that I reached out to. I had informed everyone about Bob's affair, his workplace, parents, and relatives, and even his friends. Yes, that's right. If you want to be so honest, it's best to let everyone else know the truth. 
not just me. At my words, he raised his voice more than ever before. Are you kidding me? There are things that you can and can't say, right? Oh, really? I had no idea you had such standards. So, telling me honestly that you're going to cheat on me, your wife, was a good thing to do by your standards, huh? Catherine, I was wrong. I am reflecting on my actions. Help me. I've been called to the executive office first thing in the morning, and they've decided to send me off to a remote area. Oh, wow. Really? With rumors of my affair circulating throughout the company, it doesn't look like I can work at the headquarters anymore. And I have to repay the damages on top of my salary plummeting. I can't make it without you. Well, you should have thought about my feelings more then. It's too late now. What the hell? I've even apologized to you already. You're partly to blame for me being sent to the countryside. You snitched on me. So I'm not paying you any damages. Oh, wow. I thought you couldn't turn down people by nature. I am asking you to pay alimony, please. You can't turn me down, can you? It depends on the situation, you know. Well, your foolish double standard got you into this. Basically, you brought your own self down. Unfortunately, I won't withdraw my claim for damages. This is something you're legally obligated to pay. You can't avoid it. Fine. I won't ask you for anything anymore. So, you're going to pay me? We're splitting our savings in half for property settlement. So don't touch my share. I get it. I've done a lot of favors for my friends up to now. If I ask around a bit, I'm sure there'll be plenty who lend me money. I doubt that. You cheated on me. Do you really think your friends would want to lend you money to pay for alimony? I'm not going to go into that much detail. I'm just going to tell them that I need to borrow money because I'm at a tight spot. Even if you don't mention it, everyone already knows. You... did you tell my friends too? Well, being honest is your policy, right? Stop joking now! I guess I have no choice but to ask my mom. Your mom, huh? Don't tell me. You- Yes, of course. I told your parents everything too. I finally understood that being honest isn't always easy. I was so busy informing your workplace, friends, and parents about your affair while you were out having fun with Alice. I'm screwed! It's all over now! I could hear Bob's despair from the other end of the phone. He was facing a future of living alone in the countryside, unable to rely on anyone, and spending his days repaying damages. All of this was the result of his own actions. He fooled around doing as he pleased, under his motto of being true to oneself. On the other hand, I met another man a few years later, and was now about to get remarried. My new partner is a person who isn't afraid of turning people down, and is always considerate of my feelings. It's the bare minimum, but now that I've broken up with Bob, I've finally realized the importance of having a partner that respects you. This time, it seems like I'll have a happy marriage. What do you think the time is? Where's my dinner? I'm sorry. But I did tell you this morning that I'd be late again due to work. You think I can remember every little thing like that? Ugh. I wish I could just ditch my old wife and marry a younger woman. Whenever my husband has a complaint, he jumps to the idea of getting rid of his old wife. Today, he is griping about a late dinner, even though I had told him that I'll be late because my part-time job is busy right now. He conveniently forgets his own forgetfulness. My name is Lissa. I've been married to Jimmy, who was frequenting my workplace for 13 years. What should have been a happy married life soured due to conflicts with father-in-law who lives nearby. Jimmy's philosophy of out with the old, in with the new all comes from father-in-law. Father-in-law regrets that mother-in-law was three years older and treats mother-in-law like an old lady every chance he gets. Father-in-law wanted Jimmy to marry a younger woman and made a displeased face when he found out I was two years older at our first meeting. Why would you settle for leftovers? Think about it. But since father-in-law didn't like me, mother-in-law and sister-in-law were kind to me. Mother-in-law, who loves hot springs, was very pleased when I took her and sister-in-law to the spa. On a day off, I pretended to go to the spa with mother-in-law, but went straight to Home Depot instead. 
After shopping for various items, I U-turned home about an hour later. When I quietly unlocked the door, I heard water running in the bathroom. Apparently, Jimmy was in there. As I tiptoed down the hallway, I heard a woman's laughter from the bathroom. I knew it. I felt a cold chill run down my spine. Jimmy had brought a woman home, and they were together in the bathroom. Flashback, several hours earlier. Lissa, you're going to the spa with Mom tomorrow, right? Yeah, sorry. Shall we cancel tomorrow? No, it's fine. You haven't been in a while, so take your time. Enjoy some good food. He said, handing me a hundred dollar bill. Jimmy, who usually complained when I came back late from being with mother-in-law, unusually allowed me to return late and even gave me some spending money? Something was off. Could this be the phenomenon of when a husband cheats, he becomes kinder to his wife? Feeling guilty about cheating, a husband becomes excessively kind to his wife, giving her unusual gifts, which gives away the infidelity. Jimmy's next action confirmed my suspicions. I'm going to take a shower now. Jimmy briskly headed to the bathroom, even taking his mobile phone. Normally, Jimmy hated showers, calling them a hassle. He never went to the bathroom unless I nagged him. Afterwards, he'd wander around in just his underwear, refusing to dress, saying, it's my house. What's wrong with doing as I please? By the way, Jimmy never used his mobile phone to listen to music in the bathroom. So why would he take his phone into the bathroom? It meant either he had someone he wanted to contact immediately or didn't want me to see his phone. Both scenarios point to one fact. Jimmy is having an affair. Normally, I trust Jimmy, and as much as possible... Even though we're married, I don't want to invade his privacy by looking into his mobile phone. However, if there's a possibility of infidelity, I cannot just overlook it. That's a fact. Late at night, I quietly woke up and sneakily opened Jimmy's mobile phone. The passcode was likely a combination of the numbers on the license plate of a car he used to own. Since his bank pin is the same, I roughly figured it out. Sure enough, the mobile phone opened easily. Then, picture after picture emerged, each featuring a young woman who looked at least 10 years younger and a middle-aged man with a receding hairline. I was amazed that such an older man like my husband could get attention from a young woman like her. And there were text messages between them too. Who's this? Oh, the other party is Crystal. Got it. The most recent conversation revealed Jimmy's joyful voice and the reason for the extra allowance he had given me. Tomorrow? Wife will be out for sure. Yeah? So, as promised, can I come to your house? I'll be waiting. Then I'll wear the underwear you bought me last time. Will you undress me? Of course. In the bed you always share with your wife. Yes. The fact that Jimmy, who once loved me so much, was gone weighed heavily on my heart. That night, I cried quietly by myself. I swore I will definitely take revenge. Now, I tiptoed to the door in front of the bathroom and locked it with a motorcycle theft prevention lock. The loud sound of the lock closing didn't seem to be noticed as I had timed it with the commotion in the bathroom. I called my mother-in-law. Mother-in-law, Jimmy is indeed having an affair. I knew it. Lissa, I'm truly sorry. I'll be right there. Looking around the living room, I saw an unfamiliar female bag. I took out the mobile phone inside and found no passcode. In the phone book, I saw mom, but got no answer. Next was brother, 
so I called there. Hello, are you Crystal's brother? Who are you? I introduced myself and began to explain. Actually, at my house right now, Crystal is in the bathroom with my husband. What? Are you saying my sister Crystal is having an affair with your husband? I don't want to believe it, but it seems that way. What? My sister's kind and cares about our mother. Don't lie. His shouting was so loud that I had to hold the phone away from my ear as I continued. So I thought I'd ask you to come pick her up. I tried calling your mother, but she didn't answer. Why not see for yourself if I'm lying? I see. Mom didn't answer. Yes. Good. Mom is preparing for surgery and is in the hospital. Please, I'll come, but promise not to call Mom. I understand. If that's the situation, I promise. Thank you. I owe you one. After a while, the doorbell rang repeatedly. Then the sound of water coming from the bathroom quieted down. Who is it at this time? Is it a delivery? Jimmy, what are you doing? Giving up halfway? A conversation was overheard. Yes. I reacted to the doorbell and to the two people in the bathroom, the one surprised. Yikes. Lissa, why? Oh, your wife! With panicked voices, more splashing water could be heard. Then a loud noise of someone trying to open the bathroom door came through. Hey, what's going on? It won't open. Hey, let me out. I could imagine Jimmy's pathetic attempt to open the door naked, and I opened the front door laughing. <laughs> Father-in-law, mother-in-law, and sister-in-law's relatives were all gathered. Lissa, where's Jimmy? Is he still inside? Yes, I locked it tight. <laughs> Way to go! Yes, evidence is most important, I thought. Mom? Sister? A sound like dropping a heavy load was heard. It seemed that Jimmy had fallen over in surprise. Come on, this is not time to sit down. Mother-in-law screamed at the sight of the scattered clothes for two in the living room. What is this? Evidence number two. I'll collect it now. I picked up the woman's clothing and unlocked the bathroom. Inside were two pale-faced individuals wrapped in bath towels. Here's Crystal's clothes. Please come out once you've dressed. Hey, what about mine? Jimmy, this should be enough for you. Just underwear? Well, Jimmy, you always wear underwear only after a bath, don't you? After a while, the two seemed resigned and came out of the bathroom. Jimmy was in his underwear, and his wet hair was plastered thinly to his forehead. Lissa, I'm sorry. I'll grant you any wish. Please forgive me. A divorce will suffice. Don't rely on my money. What? But you said you don't need an older wife. A woman who scatters clothes all over the living room is no better than Lissa. Cheating is your own fault. You'll have to work daily jobs or whatever to earn the divorce settlement. No way, Dad. Just then, the doorbell rang, announcing a visitor. When I responded, Crystal screamed at the sight of the man on the monitor. My brother! I'm sorry, I called him. It's not fair to only Jimmy. He'll kill me! Oh, Crystal, are you okay? It's not me. It's Jimmy who's not okay. My brother is a former fighter. What? Opening the door, a tall man was already bowing deeply. I'm Mike, Crystal's brother. I apologize for the trouble my sister has caused you. No need to apologize, sir. Anyway, please come in. Excuse me, Crystal? Mike stood up. A muscular man who appeared to be six foot five feet tall. He walked into the living room with then looked straight at his sister with sharp, animal-like eyes. Crystal looked like she was about to cry. Crystal, 
Did you really have an affair with this man? His sister nodded with a pale face. Mike slowly shifted his gaze to Jimmy, coming close enough that their noses almost touched. Jimmy was unable to even meet his eyes, frozen in terror by the intensity of Mike's gaze. You tricked and toyed with Crystal. Jimmy froze, unable to move. What's going on? Jimmy, who was firmly grabbed by the shoulders and couldn't escape, nodded his head like a broken doll. Mike laughed at himself, saying, <laughs> Oops, it's unprofessional to hit an amateur, and released Jimmy's shoulders, bowing his head deeply again. Listen, family, my sister has truly caused you trouble, but I still can't believe it, even hearing it from Crystal's mouth. My sister has had a crush on someone. Well, he's my disciple. If he was willing, I was planning to let them marry. Uh, with Mitch? Crystal's cheeks turned red and her eyes sparkled. Well, that's all ruined now. No way. Of course. You, trying to be happy by stealing someone else's happiness? What are you thinking, huh? Crystal shrank to half her size at the, at the loud, angry voice. Um, the mystery deepens. Crystal likes this Mitch guy, right? So, why with my balding brother? I'm not balding. Not yet. No, it's too late now. It's because Jimmy said he would pay for my mother's surgery. Apparently, Crystal's mother needed expensive surgery, and she got involved with Jimmy because he dangled money in front of her. What? Just because it's for your mother? Infidelity with a married man is not acceptable. Haven't you learned from the pain? Eek! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Crystal apologized, rubbing her head on the floor. Jimmy, you have a good wife like Lissa and you took advantage of Crystal's feelings for her parents. Hi, hi, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jimmy apologized, his forehead nearly buried in the floor. But the thing with my mother was just the beginning, and I got hooked, too. I'm sorry. While keeping Mike, who had been apologizing all along, standing. I had an idea. Mother... About the compensation you said you'd give me? I'll have Jimmy pay for it. So if you'd like, use it for Crystal's mother's surgery. Oh yes, let's do that. No, no. Just the thought is enough. Don't underestimate my shop's income, Crystal. I picked up my packed carry-on bag and handed Jimmy the divorce papers. You're prepared? Huh? Yes, I prepared, all night crying preparing to leave you. Lissa, I'm sorry. I left the house, leaving Jimmy three years later. A long line formed in front of the sign, Knockout Grill and Bar Number 2, opening today. Welcome. Oh, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, father-in-law, too. You all came. And thank you for the opening flowers. Lissa, congratulations on the opening. And this is a wedding gift. Mother-in-law handed over a bag filled with thick wads of cash. Oh, I can't accept this much. Why not? Just take it. Thank you. Mitch, come over here. Thank you for your kindness and for giving us a good deal on the rent for this place. Mitch's barbecue ribs are exceptional. It's a small thing compared to that. I thought that after the divorce, I wouldn't see mother-in-law and the others again, and felt lonely. But mother-in-law and the others still called me and invited me to the spa. The only thing that's changed is what's written on paper, they said. So I remained a spa buddy with mother-in-law and sister-in-law, just like before. After learning about Mike's shop through Crystal's situation, and since father-in-law loved barbecue ribs, we became captivated by their deliciousness. When Mitch, who was training at Mike's shop, confessed to me, I initially refused since he was seven years younger. But surprisingly, father-in-law approved. 
Lissa. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Your calm and generous handling of Jimmy's affair was impressive. That's when you see the difference in people. There's nothing better than an older wife. I do wish you'd reconcile with Jimmy, but thinking of your happiness, isn't being with Mitch the best thing for you? And now, Mitch and I are married. And Mitch, who rented land from father-in-law, decided to open a shop there under a franchise agreement with Mike's shop. By the way, I don't know if Jimmy's affair was discovered by his company, but he was transferred to the Dallas branch and hasn't been able to return. Speaking of which, it's good that Mike's mother is doing well. How's Crystal? Mike is helping out today as well. She's transferred to Seoul. Heartbroken. It's her own fault. <laughs> Crystal, who broke up with Jimmy, confessed to Mitch, but was rejected, saying, I have someone I like. Mitch asked me out right after that. Yes, it's really delicious. It's getting great reviews on social media, too. Thank you. It's all thanks to you. The time when Jimmy was cheating in the bathroom now seems like the lowest point in my life. Step by step, I built bonds with various people, and now I'm here. From now on, Mitch and I want to live happily by continuing to make delicious barbecue ribs, putting our hearts into each dish. My name is Leah, and I'm 33 years old, a civil servant who works in a national administrative agency. Life's been a grind with a hectic schedule, but I'm doing what I've always wanted to do since my student days, so I'm pretty fulfilled. In my personal life, I've been living with my partner Huey for five years. We're not officially married, just a common-law couple. Huey's parents often say, It's fine now, but shouldn't you consider getting married for the future? But we haven't taken that step yet. You see, my family is steeped in male chauvinism. They prioritize the eldest son above all. My parents, and even my grandparents on both sides, have always treated me like I'm worthless, just because I'm the eldest daughter. Despite being the first child for my parents, and the first grandchild on my dad's side, no one ever showed interest in me. I have a talent show at school tomorrow, can you come? I've asked my mom and dad countless times only to be mocked and told. If we had time, we'd rather sleep. They would say, You're really stupid if you don't understand that. And they just make fun of me. I remember feeling heartbroken seeing my friend's parents taking photos and videos during school events. Then, just before I started elementary school, my brother Miles was born. The joy from my parents and grandparents was overwhelming. Even my workaholic dad would rush home if mom texted. Miles seems a bit feverish, maybe he's caught a cold. They'd both stay up all night taking care of him. So, when I started elementary school, neither of my parents even attended the orientation. They'd tell the school, We're too busy with our son to care about our daughter. I was alone on my first day of school, watching other families take commemorative photos. Not just my parents, but my grandparents, too, acted like Miles was the only grandchild that mattered. In particular, Miles' paternal grandparents who lived with him bought him everything he wanted and were happy to take him anywhere he wanted to go. Because of this upbringing, Miles grew up to be a selfish, arrogant person who looked down on everyone else, especially me. He'd often take my food or destroy my belongings for fun, and no one in the family would bat an eye. Once, he tore up a book I'd borrowed from a friend. When I scolded him, my family said, It's just a book, you can replace it. That's exactly right. That's why girls are so troublesome. That's right, it's best for boys to be energetic. Miles is growing up wonderfully, they'd add, praising him without a hint of criticism. Miles would just smirk, showing no signs of remorse. This cycle had been ongoing since Miles was born. I grew up without feeling any warmth or love from anyone in my family. I had just one wish. To attend college as far away from home as possible, essentially 
cutting ties with my family. At home, my brother Miles was always in the way, or I'd get tasked with chores that interrupted my studies. So, I hit the books and libraries and empty classrooms after school. To cover college application fees and travel expenses for school tours and exams, I worked part-time at grocery stores. All that effort paid off. I got into a prestigious university. My parents and grandparents couldn't care less. If you want to go, go, but don't expect any help from us, they said. I saw that coming a mile away. I had already applied for every scholarship I could and planned to live in a dorm to minimize costs. Plus, I had my best friend Selena. We'd been friends since elementary school, and she and her parents knew all about my family situation. Selena's dad worked at the same company as mine, albeit in a different department. My dad's chauvinistic behavior was often a topic of discussion at his workplace. My mom and Selena's mom even went to the same school, and she told me my mom had similar domineering personalities like my dad. When Selena and I first became friends, her parents were worried. Friends with the daughter of that couple? But they warmed up to me after seeing how much Selena praised me and how I stood by her when she was being isolated by other girls in class. If it weren't for you, Leah, my school life would have been miserable. Thank you. Selena would say, but the truth is, I don't know what I would have done without her and her parents. They were the ones who kept me going. I was able to survive because of Selena, who laughed and said, Leah, you be you. And Selena's parents, who always offered a helping hand. Without them, I might have lost my way or given up on life altogether. As for college, Selena had already decided to attend a local university. I've got nothing to do until graduation, so let me help you, Leah," she said. She helped me with the nitty-gritty details of placement exam logistics, like booking hotels and flights. On the day I left for college, my family didn't bother to see me off, but Selena and her parents came to the airport. As we said our goodbyes, she handed me an envelope. This is a farewell gift from all of us. You'll need stuff for dorm life, right? Inside was $2,000. I tried to refuse, but she insisted. Take it. We'll always be friends. But I won't be able to help you like before. She said, tears in her eyes. I never touched that money during my college years. Holding on to that envelope reminded me of Selena and her family, giving me the strength to keep going. After graduating from college, I went on to graduate school, which was my dream. I passed the civil service exam and took my first steps into the working world. Selena and I kept in touch through texts, and she even visited me during family vacations. Selena ended up working as an administrative staff member at a local hospital after graduating from college. After eight years, I returned to my hometown for the first time in 12 years. I was invited to her wedding, where she and a doctor who worked at the same hospital as her was getting married. During those 12 years, my maternal grandparents had passed away. But my paternal grandparents, who lived with us, was still healthy. My brother Miles had enrolled in a prestigious middle school, considered the most challenging in our area, the same year I went to college. My parents were proud, saying things like, Miles is just like me, so talented. We're excited for his future. <laughs> Absolutely, we might even have to send him abroad for studies. But Miles, who was considered a child prodigy in elementary school, found himself among equally capable students in his new school. He was shocked when he scored average on his first exam. This can't be the real me. I'm better than this. Instead of putting in the effort, he blamed everyone else, teachers, classmates, the school, even timing, for his shortcomings. By the time he reached ninth grade, the school suggested he consider transferring, saying it would be less stressful for him. But both Miles and my parents couldn't accept the reality due to their pride, and Miles continued on to high school. As feared, he couldn't keep up and eventually dropped out. At that time, I was in grad school. My parents suddenly asked, Aren't there any schools there that Miles could get into? The more prestigious, the better. Of course, a school with tradition would be ideal for Miles. Don't you know any influential professors? I told them that was unrealistic, 
They accused me of being cold and heartless, but I maintained that what's impossible is impossible, and eventually, we lost contact. According to Selena, who had stayed in our hometown, my parents eventually enrolled Miles in an online high school. They made excuses like, our son is too exceptional for regular education. He would only attract jealousy and make life difficult for himself. Miles graduated from the online high school, went to a local college, and got a job at a subsidiary of my dad's company through my grandfather's influence. I met Miles again when I attended Selena's wedding. I had returned to my hometown two days before the wedding, at Selena's request. I have something I want to talk about, she had said. I wasn't keen on visiting my parents, so I stayed at the hotel where the wedding was to take place. I spent some relaxing time with Selena, going to the spa and such. We were invited to dinner by Selena's parents and it was at the hotel restaurant that I ran into Miles and my parents. They didn't recognize me at first. I guess that's understandable. When I lived at home, I was skinny and didn't have the luxury of caring about my appearance like other girls. It was only when my parents greeted Selena's parents that they realized I was their daughter. Leah, is that you? You're back in town? My, my, you've changed. Are you free later? Maybe we could. They were oddly friendly, but I wasn't in the mood. I'm heading back right after Selena's reception, so I don't have time, I said and quickly left. I did make eye contact with Miles, but to be honest, I wouldn't have recognized him on the street. He had lost his youthful look, and now had a face that oozed cunning. After the wedding, I returned to my condo. Soon after, I started receiving messages from my parents and Miles, who had forcibly obtained my number from Selena's parents. According to a message from Selena's father, who apologized for giving them my contact, it seemed they wanted me to attend Miles' wedding. Miles is getting married? Yes, apparently to the younger sister of a college classmate. She's only 21 and quite beautiful. What does that have to do with me attending? According to Selena's father, Miles had gotten his job through my grandfather's connections, but his self-esteem far exceeded his actual abilities. He also had a bad habit of looking down on people and would say things like, No need to listen to people who've stayed in this backwater town. <laughs> Making him unpopular. That's why when he announced his wedding, almost everyone from colleagues to bosses gave excuses like, I plan to have a terrible cold that day, or... My tarot card reading advised against going in the direction of the venue. Planning to have a cold, huh? I see. My parents and Miles didn't want to be outdone by the number of attendees from the bride's side. Even though I'm not the most exciting sister or daughter, they seemed to think it was better to have me there, given that I have a graduate degree from a prestigious university and a government job. I was annoyed by their shallow thinking. Competing over the number of attendees is ridiculous. But if I kept ignoring them, they'd surely pester Selena's father, saying, Tell our daughter to get in touch. So I reluctantly replied to Miles's message. He said, Long time no talk. You must be happy to be useful to the family for once. <laughs> I ignored his petty comment and decided to attend the wedding just to minimize the hassle. Fast forward to the wedding day two months later. The bride was as beautiful as Selena's father had described and she seemed genuinely kind and straightforward. I wondered why such a wonderful woman would marry someone like Miles, but I decided not to pry and just play my role as the groom's sister. After the wedding, Miles and his new wife left for their honeymoon. No one tried to keep me around, and I had nothing to say to my parents or grandparents, so I briefly visited Selena's home, said my greetings, and left. Time passed without any contact until Miles suddenly reached out, inviting me to come see the cherry blossoms. It wasn't a grand event like the National Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, D.C., but my hometown also had a botanical garden with cherry trees. It's a common seasonal event. However, I was suspicious. It turned out the real agenda wasn't cherry blossoms, but convincing me to give up my inheritance rights. Apparently, there's a big land development plan near our family home. A major developer was planning to buy up the area to build a large condo complex. Real estate transactions were heating up around our family home. Our home, 
was situated right in the planned development area. Our great-grandfather used to run a firewood and charcoal business there, so the property was quite large. It included not just the house, but also a sizable parking area. It seemed Miles and my parents, enticed by the rising land value, wanted to ensure I didn't get a share of the inheritance in the future. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, they say. I never really cared about inheritance, but Huey once advised me. Even if you don't need it, it might be good to settle things once and for all. So I decided to go back home. I booked the same hotel I stayed in before, and I planned to meet my family at the botanical garden. Then came the day. I arrived at the designated spot and found my sister-in-law, whom I'd met only once at a wedding, sitting alone on a bench. I was three hours early, but she was there even before me. She seemed well prepared, but her face was pale and dark circles were evident under her eyes. Um, do you remember me? I'm Leah, Miles' sister. We met at the wedding. Upon hearing this, she stood up in surprise, but almost immediately stumbled. I quickly reached out to catch her. She was surprisingly light and frail. It was like looking at myself back in high school. I'm sorry, um, thank you, she said. Her name was Carolyn, if I remembered correctly. Carolyn, right? If you're not feeling well, don't push yourself. Let's sit down. We sat back down, but the bench was cold, probably from the rain earlier. Upon closer inspection, Carolyn's apron and hair were damp, as if she'd been caught in the rain. What time did you get here? We agreed to meet at noon, right? Yes, but I was told to secure the best spot for cherry blossom viewing, so I've been sitting here all night to make sure no one else took it. This might be the best spot for cherry blossoms, but you didn't have to go through all this trouble. But if I don't do as Miles says, not just him, but Trevor and Jasmine will scold me too. This is just how it always is. Trevor and Jasmine are the names of my dad and mom. Hearing Carolyn's story, I felt a rage that made my whole body tremble. I immediately took off my coat and put it on Carolyn, then sent a message to Selena. That afternoon, while Selena and I were taking a break, she got an internal call. I think it's probably from Leah's family. How should I respond? I wrote down what I wanted Selena to tell my parents and Miles and handed it to her. Sure enough, within an hour, Miles and my parents rushed in. Hey, what do you mean there's no reason to see you anymore? Exactly, we had to search all over the garden because you broke the appointment and didn't even contact us. And finally, someone told us they saw you and Selena together. And that person said you were with my wife too. The three of them started yelling, but Selena sternly told them to keep their voices down as we were in a hospital. But their silence lasted only a moment. The next second, they turned to Selena. Who are you? Don't butt in. If you're not family, leave. They barked. However, Selena, who deals with various patients and their families daily as a senior administrator in the hospital, wasn't phased. I'm not an outsider. I helped bring your wife from the botanical garden to this hospital. Right now, Carolyn's receiving treatment and resting in her room, so you can't see her. Hearing this, Miles and my parents became even angrier. Why do I need permission to see my own wife? Explain what's going on. They were unbearably loud. Fed up, I first turned to my parents. Keep it down. Can't you remember being told to be quiet just a minute ago? Is there something wrong with your memory? Then to Miles, who was standing next to my parents with a red face, I said, You dare call yourself a husband while mistreating your wife? How ironic. Just then, Huey appeared, accompanied by two police officers. All right, here we are. This is the husband and relatives of the victim I mentioned earlier. As Huey pointed to the three, their faces, which had been so red, suddenly tensed and turned pale. What's going on? Why are the police here? Victim? You mean Carolyn? Isn't this an exaggeration? She just felt a little sick. Stammering, Miles and my parents tried to argue back. Huey handed them his business card. Ah, I should have mentioned earlier. I'm Leah's partner and a lawyer. From now on, I'll be representing Carolyn. Nice to meet you. Representing my wife? What do you mean, representing? Making a woman sit alone outdoors overnight in temperatures below 41 degrees Fahrenheit just to secure a cherry blossom viewing spot is far from normal by any standard. But still, isn't it strange for a lawyer to get involved in something like this? 
When a client asks for representation, it's natural for a lawyer to provide it. Besides, you guys cancelled Carolyn's cell phone contract over a year ago and hardly give her any money. What if something had happened while she was out there? But nothing did happen, so... That's beside the point. Can't you imagine what would happen if someone went without food or water for nearly half a day? You're not kids anymore. But, but... Moreover, when you told her to secure the spot, you didn't even give her time to dress properly for the outdoors. You even locked her out immediately. How is this not malicious behavior? Huey spoke smoothly, and the two police officers beside him nodded with stern expressions. I chimed in. When I met her, she was freezing and looked pale. That's why we brought her to this hospital in Selena's car right away. Actually, I was at the botanical garden three hours before meeting Miles and my parents because I had plans to meet Selena. I had texted Selena that I was meeting Miles and my parents under the guise of cherry blossom viewing. She suggested, why not take a stroll in the botanical garden to calm your nerves before that? I agreed as I was feeling a bit uneasy. Thanks to arriving much earlier, I was able to find Carolyn in poor condition. Panicked, I immediately called Selena, who was still at home. Her husband, a doctor, advised to bring her to the hospital as soon as possible and even came to pick us up as he was on his way to work. Thanks to that, Carolyn received prompt medical attention and her body temperature and color soon returned to normal. However, based on Selena's husband's diagnosis that she was both physically and mentally weak, she was transferred to the inpatient ward. In the meantime, after hearing Carolyn's story during the ride to the hospital and between exams, I consulted with Selena and contacted Huey, who promptly came over. Huey then acted as Carolyn's attorney, consulting with the police and contacting her family. As far as I'm concerned, your actions against my client could be considered assault. Naturally, I plan to file a complaint in that regard. Upon hearing this, Miles's face changed color. Assault? That's a bit much. I didn't physically harm her or anything. Assault doesn't just refer to physical injuries. Past cases have defined it as adversely affecting a person's health. Adversely affecting health? She just felt a little sick. There's no need to make a big deal out of it. Whether it's a big deal or not is for the police and prosecutors to decide. As Huey said this, the police officer standing behind us said, Let's take you somewhere to hear more about this. And let the three of them away. After getting an earful from the police, Miles and his parents returned home, only to find Carolyn's family waiting for them, looking furious. According to what Carolyn later told me, her brother had always thought of Miles as a bright and caring friend. When Miles started dating Carolyn, her brother was thrilled. But then Miles told him that Carolyn said, I've always hated my family. Now that I'm married, I finally cut ties. I told them to not contact me anymore. After that, her brother was blocked on all forms of communication. He even visited their home, but was turned away, being told, She's crying and doesn't want to see you. Please leave. On the other hand, Carolyn was told by Miles, Your brother never liked you. He begged me to take you off his hands. I only married you out of obligation, not love. My parents and grandparents also kept telling her, You're a burden. Just be grateful. We're putting up with you. Clearly, they were trying to isolate Carolyn from her family to use her for their own convenience. What a despicable bunch. But all their schemes came to light because of this incident. Carolyn's family, who rushed over after hearing the news, took turns, staying with her until she recovered and was discharged from the hospital. Although the police ultimately let them off with a stern warning, in a small town like mine, social condemnation can be far worse than legal repercussions. When we took Carolyn to the hospital, the three of them showed up at the botanical garden, only to find it occupied by another group, which led to a heated argument. Word spread quickly about the incident, and rumors started flying. Miles and my dad felt so humiliated, they ended up quitting their jobs. As a result, it seems that he repeatedly treated his young wife so badly that he even sent her to the hospital. Oh, I heard he went on a rampage that even the police were called. Even the husband's parents got together and took his wife mentally. Miles and Dad quit because they couldn't stand it anymore, as these rumors spread, with some exaggeration, not just in their workplace, but also in their neighborhood. Moreover, a big land development deal fell through, causing property values to plummet. Miles and his family, who had bought up neighboring lands, ended up in massive debt. 
Carolyn's family then demanded a divorce, compensation, and a division of assets, pushing everyone to the brink. My grandparents lost all their assets and had to move into a care facility after the shock of being kicked out of their home. Miles and my parents, now facing a hefty divorce settlement, begged Huey, who was representing Carolyn for help and mediation. But Huey simply responded, You must be joking. <laughs> if you try to contact Leah or me for money, we'll have to respond legally. I had changed my number while my parents and Miles were being questioned by the police, and they didn't even know my current address or workplace. So there's no way they could contact me directly anymore. Now that I'm free from all the complications related to my family home, especially since my grandparents' inheritance is gone, I feel utterly liberated.